Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science, and I get asked a lot of little questions, too small for their own video. So here it is, another frequently asked questions video. I get asked a lot about snail slime and some of those other more exotic ingredients. So does snail slime actually work in a cosmetic? Now there's various grades of so-called snail filtrate extract and different grades have different nutrient contents. But one of the main things that's common to all of these snail filtrate extracts is the mucus polysaccharides. Now these are actually highly hygroscopic which means they draw atmospheric water into the skin. This means they help provide suppleness pretty much like any other humectant would but they tend to do it on a much grander scale. They may also contain glycosaminoglycans and some proteolytic enzymes, as well as some moisture protecting film formers. Now, different extracts contain different amounts of these materials, so the extract needs to be used at the amount that is going to provide the best results. And this varies for different materials. So it really depends on the material, what the supplier is recommending, the nutrient profile of that material to give the best results. But the short answer is yes, these snail filtrate extracts contain components that will help bring suppleness to the skin and help provide moisture protective benefits. So the end result is more supple looking and hydrated skin. This brings me to another question I get asked a lot about, do extracts really work? So I've done a video on how to select the best active. I've created a video answering do cosmetics actually work? And I've also shown you how to make your own herbal extracts at home. So bringing all of these together, let me now answer this question, do herbal extracts work? Well, it all depends. It depends on the way the extract has been created. So you would have seen in one of my videos, I showed you how to make some really basic alcohol or glycerin based extracts. Now these haven't been efficacy tested, which means I can't be making clinically proven claims about those ingredients. But when you buy more specialty extracts from larger suppliers, they've conducted in vivo efficacy. They have results to show you that their extracts perform certain functions or help produce certain visible effects in the skin. So not all extracts are created equal. In fact, they're created very differently. And this can have a huge impact on whether the extract is going to do anything for the skin or just be a good marketing claim. If you're buying small quantities of cheap extracts or making your own, then you really don't have any in vivo efficacy data to suggest that those extracts are doing any benefit to your skin. You also don't have any input amounts that are clinically proven to support your claims or to provide proof that they are doing anything for your skin. But if you're using an extract from a supplier that provides you with in vivo efficacy data for their material through a proper clinical trial, then yes, that extract is going to provide some real visible benefits to the skin in the finished product. But there's additional considerations. When using extracts, especially the high end in vivo proven extracts, make sure you're adding them to the formula in the amount that has been proven in the in vivo efficacy data. Make sure the end product is being used the way it was in the study. For example, a high end active extract that is used in a once a week face mask is not going to provide you the same benefits that the in vivo clinical data showed when the same product was applied twice a day over 28 days the ingredients simply wouldn't be used enough. There's also some additional considerations that can impact how well those clinically proven extracts can work in a finished product. And this has to do a lot with compatibilities in the base product, delivery of the active, and pH of the finished product. Now, you can have pH compatibility with the skin, but you need to also make sure that the finished product 
has a pH that ensures bioavailability of that extract throughout the product's shelf life. You also need to make sure it remains homogeneously mixed throughout that product for its shelf life, and this can be done through stability testing. That is how to make sure that that high-end active with good in vivo efficacy data actually performs the way it did in the clinical trials in your finished product. But again, if you're creating your own extracts and don't run clinical trials, or using cheat grades of extracts, even in large proportions, you don't have any efficacy data to prove that those extracts work. And that's possibly where some of the confusion about whether extracts work or not may come from. This brings me to another question I get asked a lot, and that is, do ingredients like superfoods, gold, and gemstones work in cosmetics? Well, I'm gonna point you straight back to the suppliers of these materials here and suggest you ask them for in vivo efficacy data to support their materials. And in any case, if you intend to make claims about what these ingredients are doing in your finished product, you'll need to hold in vivo efficacy data to prove any claims about these ingredients providing benefits to the skin of the end user. There's loads of materials out there, so always look for the evidence. And your supplier should be able to provide this to you or look for another supplier of those materials. I get asked a lot about collagens, elastin, protein in products, and does it really work? Well, I'm gonna answer that question with a question, and that is, what do you want it to do? And another thing you need to consider is size matters. The molecular weight of these substances can vary, again, depending on the grade of the material. Now, if you want to get penetration to the mid layers of the epidermis for some structural support, some integrity, some support for elastin strength, uh, some repair to skin or hair, then you really should be looking for materials that have a molecular weight less than 500. If you are looking for materials that will sit in the stratum corneum and also provide some structural integrity, but also protective benefits from moisture losses, then you're really gonna look for materials with a molecular weight between 500 and about 2,500. Much more than a molecular weight of 2,500, and these materials will sit on the surface of the skin or the hair, but they still provide benefits. They're still very strong structures. They can help with the overall feel of the skin or the hair, and they can also provide some structural integrity and protective effects against moisture losses by having more of a film forming function. So when selecting your materials, you really need to look at where do you want their work to be done and what do you need them to do in your finished product. Look for the molecular weight and also look at the results that they should provide to your finished formula to pick the material weight and size that matters for you. I get asked a lot about pH in formulas and if I'm adding sodium hydroxide to adjust the pH of my formula, is this the same as adding caustic soda? Well, let me explain it to you this way. When we are adjusting pH in a formula, we use certain materials to buffer the pH. Take it up a little, take it down a little. And generally we're adjusting pH to make the finished product skin or hair compatible. Sometimes we need to use extremes of pH for different reasons. Like for instance, in acid pills, we need a low pH generally to help with the bioavailability of those acid materials. And it also has a keratolytic effect on the skin. For hair dyes, we need to lift the hair cuticle. So we need quite an alkaline medium to do that so that we can get color into the hair and then we can get our oxidative hair dye to work. But for most of our cosmetics, we want it to be skin compatible, around a pH of 5.5. Sometimes we might be using active ingredients or preservatives that need us to manipulate that pH a little, or we may need to do that to suit some of the other materials in the formulation. 
But when we add something like sodium hydroxide to adjust the pH, it dissociates out into its ions. It's not caustic soda anymore. So no, adding sodium hydroxide to our formula is not like putting caustic soda into our formula. It is a way of us manipulating the finished product pH to suit the ingredients and the skin. Interestingly, traditional saponification, which so many people uh, think is natural and safe, yields a finished product with a pH above 9.5, usually up around 10 or more. This is actually quite harsh on the skin, regardless of what else gets added to that natural soap. So Sindet bars, like your Dove bars, for example, have a pH more around 6. They're much more skin compatible, even though they have some synthetic detergent materials in there. So natural doesn't mean safer, and we are adding a lot more sodium hydroxide to create a naturally saponified soap than we are when we're adding a few drops of a diluted sodium hydroxide to end up with a skin compatible pH in a finished product. So they're definitely not the same thing. And if you have issues with sodium hydroxide in a formula to adjust that final pH to be skin friendly, then don't use soap because it's really not mild or friendly to the skin when it's been through a naturally saponified process because that finished pH is up around 10, which is not good on anyone's skin. This brings me to the next question I get asked a lot and that's about ethanol in formulations. Is it drying to the skin and is it a problem? Well, ethanol in a formula is drying to the skin. If we're only using small quantities on oily skin types, it has a positive effect. It helps dry up those excess sebum secretions and it helps give the end user an appearance they're looking for. You wouldn't want to use it on someone with dry skin because there's no point. And when you're using ethanol in antibacterial hand gels, for example, it does provide an antibacterial benefit. But you should follow the use of those antibacterial gels with a high ethanol content with some moisturizers because it can be drying to the skin. It also helps when you want to speed up the dry time of a formula. So it's great in perfumes, aerosols or other formulas where you want it to be a quick dry skin feel. And when it's used around 5 or 10%, it won't cause too much drying to the skin, especially when there's other lipids or other conditioning or moisturizing materials in the formula. You'll get your quick dry benefit without excessive drying. So in answer to the question, is ethanol drying to the skin? Well, yes, if you're going to use it neat on the skin, but it can actually benefit a lot of formulas and it can actually also enhance absorption. It's great in small amounts in oily skin products and it's great when you want a fast dry effect in formulas, but again, its input is generally limited to provide that quick dry effect for fast evaporation rather than being used in inputs that's going to be drying or damaging to the skin. I get asked about fluoride in products. Now, I want to start by saying fluoride is very tightly regulated. It has been studied and the benefits of fluoride in water supplies and oral hygiene products is proven to be safe when used within regulatory limits. I want to emphasize this is very tightly regulated to ensure safe use for consumers. And I have additional information in the folder for this video so you can have a look at some of the data behind setting those limits to see the safety for yourself. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet about the use of this material in water sources and cosmetics. It's not correct. When used within regulatory limits, it has been studied extensively and its benefits have been proven time and again well within the regulatory limits used. So yes, you can use your fluoride in your toothpaste and drink water that's been fluoridated with full confidence knowing it is safe 
and has been studied rigorously. And like I say, you can contact us for full information and to review those references for yourself. This brings me to another ingredient I get asked about a lot, and that is aluminum chlorohydrate in antiperspirants. Let me start off by saying aluminum chlorohydrate is perfectly safe in your antiperspirants. We actually use it because it dissolves into this gel which forms a plug to block the sweat gland. And if you're blocking the sweat gland, you don't perspire. Antiperspirants. Now, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet again about this material, suggesting that it causes all sorts of harm from breast cancer through to Alzheimer's. I wanted to point out that you are actually uh, exposed to a lot more aluminum through dietary use. Cans, cookware, there's a lot more of it out there than you'd ever be exposed to in your personal care products. Another thing I wanna emphasize is that we use it to block sweat glands we don't actually put it on broken skin and it doesn't actually go into lymph nodes. Another thing I wanna point out is that lymph nodes actually drain away from breast tissue, they don't flow towards breast tissue. So even though your aluminum from your antiperspirant doesn't get into your lymph node, even if it did, it wouldn't go towards breast tissue, it would actually move away from it. So a lot of this misinformation on the internet is coming from scare tactics. It's not grounded in any hard data and I don't know how they're suggesting that it's even gonna get into the bloodstream, uh, especially in the very, very small quantities that is used and applied in personal care. Like I say, you'd get much more through dietary exposure than you ever would through personal care products. There is also aluminum zirconium chlorohydrate used in antiperspirants. Now this is not permitted to be used in aerosols because it comes as a very fine uh, powder that is not good to be inhaled, so it doesn't get used in any of your powder or aerosol products. It's also a very effective antiperspirant, and this one is also really tightly regulated to help ensure safety as well. I have the research on this material and also uh, some cancer organizations, uh, their official statements about the safety of aluminium in antiperspirants in our uh, folder for this video for you as well. So you can read all of the research behind it and you can also see the regulations to be confident that the aluminum in your antiperspirants is not going to cause you any health concerns. And I also get asked a lot about PEGs, parabens, SLS, 1,4-dioxane, propylene glycol, amongst other ingredients as well. And of course, I have my other video on cosmetic ingredient safety to cover a lot of these materials. I hope you've found this information useful. Please contact us for the Dropbox link where we have all the research and regulatory information to back up all of the statements I've made in this video so you can conduct your own research and have that peace of mind. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please leave any questions or comments below and also what other topics you might want me to cover. And please make sure you subscribe to receive notifications about all our videos. Happy formulating.